Our planet has around 570 million farms, and many of them seem pretty typical. However, there are also some farms where they raise special kinds of animals. The catch is, these animals, though they'll eventually end up as meat, are actually parasites in the wild. And some of them even attack sharks. Now imagine farms with thousands of such parasites, or even millions. It's a leech, and it looks disgusting. In just six seconds, or twice as long if the leech is cautious, its jaws activate, hundreds of teeth are engaging. The leech gets down to its preferred feast, your blood. If you find one on your body, it's likely to freak you out. I definitely would be. There's also a chance you might rejoice to find out that these leeches could actually help heal your chest, finger, or ear, and even save your life. Welcome to a typical leech farm, where around 100,000 blood-sucking leeches call home. These leeches are specifically bred and provided to services like the National Health System for their medicinal properties. In lots of countries, hospitals actually use these tiny and pretty unpleasant creatures. For instance, in the UK, they're officially used to prevent blood loss. It might sound weird, since usually leeches do the opposite. Actually, leeches are quite primitive creatures from the viewpoint of biology. However, raising them can be a bit tricky and require some special care. I mean, it's just a bloodthirsty slime. But no, leeches are grown in separate rooms, each set at a specific temperature. The further you go, the colder it gets. This is how leeches turn into a medical device. Taking care of these creatures is quite a sensitive task. Whether it's feeding, starving, keeping them warm, or cooling them down, even the sound of a smartphone click can startle them. When leeches are born, they're fed sheep's blood in a sausage casing, once every six months. And then they're starved and constantly sorted. This is the main job of people who raise leeches. The cycle continues until it reaches the ultimate stage. These leeches hit this phase after going without food for six to nine months, having properly emptied out their intestines. To ensure they're as sterile as possible, the final room they inhabit before heading to hospitals is bathed in ultraviolet light. No one's allowed to go in there. Depending on demand, some leeches can stay on the farm for up to six years. And this is not that strange, because with proper care, the life expectancy of leeches easily reaches 20 years. When it's time to go, the leeches are put into a special gel. That's how they make it to hospitals. And that's when things get interesting, and kind of gross. When a leech sinks its teeth in, it releases the best anticoagulants known to exist, ensuring your blood keeps flowing for up to 10 hours. Surprisingly, this can be quite useful for humans. How? It's simple. This proves useful in surgeries that rejoin small blood vessels, like reattaching a finger or reconstructing a breast, preventing any unwanted clotting. Leeches are often used in such cases, and often they're a cool medical tool. In 2002, a survey of 50 plastic surgery departments in the UK found that 80% had used leeches in the past five years. Leeches, those simple creatures, possess an anesthetic and anticoagulant that haven't been replicated. So what happens next? Once leeches finish feeding and drop off, they're disposed of with alcohol solution. It may seem a bit harsh or even ungrateful, but it's necessary. A leech full of blood poses a risk as it could transfer blood and potentially infect someone else. No one needs that. But okay, leeches. Everyone has heard about leeches, but what about raising mosquitoes? Here, inside a two-story brick building in Medellin, Colombia, scientists work long hours in stuffy laboratories, raising millions and millions of mosquitoes. Each of these strips carries up to 10,000 mosquito eggs. People take care of insects as they go through different stages of growth, maintaining the right temperature and providing them with a diet that includes fish meal, sugar, and of course, blood. But that's not all. Afterward, these mosquitoes are set free nationwide to mate with wild mosquitoes that might spread diseases like dengue fever, posing a threat to the health of people in Colombia. So you're likely wondering, just as I am, what's going on here? Are we in some horror movie? Well, nope, this factory is the real deal. The good thing is the mosquitoes released don't cause any trouble for the locals. What's even better is that they contribute to saving and improving millions of lives, although they're oblivious to their own importance. And this is how they do it. The mosquitoes produced in this factory carry bacteria called Wolbachia, which prevent them from transmitting dengue fever and other deadly diseases to humans. 
By releasing these guys to breed with wild mosquitoes, scientists are spreading bacteria. This means that diseases spread more slowly and millions of people are protected by mosquitoes. It sounds like nonsense, but it's true, and the scheme works. In Yogyakarta, Indonesia, the presence of mosquitoes with Wolbachia bacteria has brought down dengue fever cases by 77% and hospitalizations due to dengue by 86% more effective than a vaccine. In China, there's another giant mosquito facility producing an astounding 20 million insects weekly. The main goal is to fight the deadly Zika virus. Here, lab technicians and researchers are studying trays with mosquito larvae. And these are sterile adult male mosquitoes ready to be released. In containers, of course. Outside are the lab technicians. The release of insects looks quite prosaic. They open the container in the right place and wait for the mosquitoes to fly away. Here's something interesting going on in the lab. This is how mosquitoes are fed. The blood of animals is poured onto a plate so that the mosquitoes can eat. Guess what? Even setting mosquitoes free can be interesting. They've got a drone doing it. Welcome to the 21st century. But I can't help but wonder what would happen if all those millions of mosquitoes just escaped from the lab at the same time. The mosquito apocalypse? Honestly, there's nothing to really be scared about. These lab mosquitoes are totally harmless, so there's no disease threat. But let's be real, having tens of millions of bugs around isn't exactly pleasant, even if they're all over the place. So yeah, maybe keep those windows closed at night. Do you know how mosquitoes are fed? You already know that factories rely on specially imported blood to feed mosquitoes. When they're dealing with millions of mosquitoes, it becomes necessary. However, when their numbers are lower, scientists use what they have at hand. Literally, just like that. In the lab where scientists work with mosquitoes, they have to feed the insects with their own blood. Here's how it works. Turn off the light, stick your hands or feet into a box swarming with hundreds of mosquitoes, catch up on the latest headlines, or give your mom a call as the mosquitoes enjoy a blood buffet. Okay, actually, this is an extreme measure that scientists had to take because mosquitoes turned out to be picky. They rejected the usual feeding methods like mice under anesthesia and a container of blood. Mosquitoes retained the memory of wildlife and wanted to get blood directly from a person and only in the dark. And people had to go along with that. Fortunately, according to scientists, over time, the body develops tolerance from such a number of bites, the immune system seems to stop responding to them. Though you're definitely going to feel those bites, those little critters are literally gnawing on you. The following day, the spot where you got bitten won't be all puffy and red. In fact, you probably won't even be able to find it. Ever wonder if there's anything between annoying mosquitoes no one appreciates and the helpful honeybee? Well, it turns out there is, and we call them parasitic wasps. Look at them. Although the parasitic wasps often look completely normal, these little insects are capable of doing terrible things. Luckily, their target isn't humans, but other insects. That's why we intentionally raised them, to create a handy little army. These minuscule creatures play a vital role in keeping pests in check. The parasitic wasps do not sting and are hardly larger than the white flies they attack. The name says it all. Parasitic wasps earned it because they lay eggs on or inside harmful bugs. The wasp larvae grow inside the host bug and eventually take it down. Plus, these wasps are quite picky, going after specific pests like aphids, caterpillars, or bed bugs. Also, parasitic wasps are more effective than chemicals. Pests can develop resistance to chemicals over time, but they have no defense against parasitic wasps. How can you possibly get used to a creature that uses you as an incubator? By the way, you can even buy parasitic wasps for your house. A card with tiny eggs gets delivered to you via mail. You need to put it in a closet and the parasitic wasp will fight them off. It's that simple. These insects are also grown on a larger scale. Almost 30 million parasitic wasps have been raised on this farm for mass production. And that's in just one year. Most of the parasitic wasps sold in the United States come from the Netherlands or the United Kingdom. There, manufacturers started using parasitic wasps and other beneficial insects in greenhouses more than 25 years ago. So if you want to raise wasps, the first step is raising a host insect, like a moth, bed bug, or aphid, depending on the kind of guardian you're looking for. As soon as a prey insect emerges, humans allow some adult parasitic wasps to lay their eggs in it. The wasp planted its egg in this aphid about 10 days back, and you can actually see something squirming inside like a low-key alien scene. The insects, along with their parasitic wasp buddies, are carefully packed and sent over to the farms that requested them, such as in Australia. Once there, buyers can release the newly emerged adult parasitic wasps to carry on the job. One farmer went the extra mile by setting up eight separate buildings to accommodate different wasp species. It's a big undertaking, but it pays off. 
The farms deliver the pupae in small boxes, which are then placed on the plants to allow the parasitic wasps to emerge and spread throughout the greenhouse. A new batch of parasitic wasps is released each week, and so on throughout the growing season. And then a new cycle starts. And these are isopods. They're tiny and, frankly, not the friendliest creatures. Back in 1799, sailors stumbled upon these isopods when these little critters turned into a serious problem. They got dubbed marine termites because they went all out, gnawing into the wood and wrecking ships in no time. But that was a long time ago. Today, scientists have discovered a new enzyme in these isopods that can help people recycle waste into fuel. Liquid fuels can be created from woody biomass like wood and straw by breaking down their main components, sugar polymers, into simple sugars. The next step involves fermentation, ultimately yielding the liquid biofuel. It's quite a complex and costly process, involving multiple stages and expensive equipment. Surprisingly, tiny isopods manage to accomplish the same task. Simply put, Steve is saying that using these small crustaceans as natural factories could be a money saver for humanity. It's possible we might even witness the cultivation of isopods on farms. Do you feel like the term farm is changing its traditional meaning? Yet not everyone is focused on raising animals for potential financial gain. Meet the giant isopod. It's part of the same isopoda order as those wood-munching creatures we just mentioned. Giant isopods live in deep waters, around 8,200 feet down, where they scavenge for food. Every now and then, something clicks in their brains, and isopods do this. Even though these critters are big and might not win a beauty contest, people actually find their meat tastier than some types of lobster. That's why food enthusiasts worldwide fantasize about getting a taste. A few manage to, sure, but for most, it stays just a dream. The giant isopod is a hard-to-find treat. Catching it's no easy feat because you need to go really deep. Over one fishing trip, even the most experienced fishermen will pull 20 isopods out of the water top. Also, keep in mind that the fishing season is limited to just a few months, running from March until the end of May. If you miss the chance to order an isopod this time, you'll have to wait until next year. Additionally, each isopod only contains 5 to 9 ounces of meat, which is pretty small, especially for a delicacy. Now, some attentive viewers might wonder, we've been discussing farms for a bit, and there's this pricey, tasty, and quite elusive isopod, why not set up a farm and raise them? It could be a lucrative venture. But Steve and I didn't find any information about such farms. That is, there's literally not a single one in the entire world. Raising giant isopods seems too complicated. These creatures get huge because they live at great depths, a phenomenon known as deep sea gigantism. To have a decent sized isopod farm, you need to place the farm deep underwater. Think about the maintenance. It's either practically impossible or the people running the farm would spend way more than they make. Remember, the water needs to be cold and clean, just like what the giant isopods are used to down in the depths. We can't change things up. If we try to breed them on the surface, they'll either die or end up small. It's just not worth it for such a small amount of meat. Maybe they avoid breeding giant isopods because they just don't want people having nightmares. Picture a farm with these creepy critters. Imagine this, you're standing in the dark with me, feeling the sweat trickle down your skin. The quiet around us is slowly filled with a sound like rain, a chill vibe that'd fit perfectly in a calming sleep app. But everything else in this situation won't just keep you up at night, it'll haunt your dreams for years. Take a look around. Roaches, big and small, scuttle on the wall, ceiling, and floor, disappearing as soon as you shine a light on them. We're basically in the middle of a cockroach nest, but on a massive scale. Four huge warehouses packed with rows of shelves and a complicated network of pipes that funnel leftover food from restaurants onto those shelves for their roaches to feast on. To make cockroaches feel at home, the lights are turned off, the temperature is set to a cozy 68 degrees, and the humidity is kept high. There are 60 small rooms in total. There are 20 million cockroaches in each. In total, there are more than 1 billion cockroaches. Simple math. Every day, this horde can eat 50 tons of food waste. Cockroach farming is a notable industry in China where insects are raised as livestock. It really is a pretty big industry over there, judging by the sheer number of cockroaches. It's not surprising that this practice is widespread in China, where dried cockroaches can fetch up to $20 per pound. In 2013, there were around 100 cockroach farms in the country, and this is what the largest cockroach farm in the country looks like. Six billion cockroaches are raised here every year. Six billion! As we've already said, cockroaches are raised as a food source for humans, but they could also serve as a great replacement for the usual food of various animals. 
animals like lizards and chicken. Oh, and don't forget about the Asian medical industry and all sorts of cosmetic companies. It's strange to think that this could end up in cosmetics or medicine, but that's true. But perhaps the weirdest part is the food. People actually eat cockroaches because they're a cheap source of protein. It's like having a crunchy snack with tiny legs. In China, millions of people take potions made from these cockroaches, as local authorities insist on its remarkable effect. However, they don't specify what that effect is. Before we move on, let's talk a bit more about the process of raising cockroaches. And just a friendly reminder, maybe put down that snack for a moment. Cockroaches eat a variety of foods. They're not too picky, so you can feed them things like leftover veggies or potato and pumpkin peels, which are easy to find and cheap. Cockroaches don't mind at all. Harvesting insects is quite simple. You can simply use a vacuum cleaner to remove them from their nests, or you can drown them in boiling water and let them dry out in the sun. In the 21st century, even cockroach farms are getting a high-tech upgrade with artificial intelligence. For example, it controls their food supply. Yeah, that's food. Yeah, it's a bit off-putting. Computers constantly monitor the inside environment, keeping tabs on things like food supplies, humidity levels, growth rates, and cockroach genetics. If anything changes that could slow down production, the AI automatically figures out a solution and makes the necessary adjustments. Basically, people aren't that necessary. Having fewer workers on the farm makes it incredibly profitable. Cockroaches don't get sick, their food costs almost nothing, they breed easily, and there's a huge demand. It's like a gold mine, but with cockroaches. While cockroaches serve a valuable role in waste disposal in business, I can't shake the thought that all these cockroaches could escape. If the farm goes down for some reason and billions of insects are released, it'll be a real disaster. Actually, this has already happened. In 2013, vandals attacked a cockroach farm, causing about a million cockroaches to escape. The local health authorities had to carry out massive disinfection, and residents were urged to stay calm. Even though it's hard to imagine remaining calm with cockroaches everywhere, but the cockroaches probably had a great party. As if cockroaches weren't disgusting enough, Steve found farms where they raise flies. Yeah, here's one of them. While flies are typically associated with disease and decay, the larva of the black soldier fly can be repurposed for feed additives or fertilizers. Beneath the railway arch at London Bridge, researchers raise millions of flies. They collect eggs and then feed the larva with food waste, much like they do with cockroaches. The drawback is that these larvae can get pretty stinky. They release ammonia. It's not the most enjoyable outcome of enjoying a meal. But despite their appearance and vile smell, they can become food for chickens, fish, and pigs. There are actually several farms like that on the planet. You might picture fields, barns, and muddy boots, but not all farms fit that stereotype. Some look like this. Fully automated high-tech facilities housed in commercial warehouses within industrial areas. Today, companies are working on technology to mass-produce insects. They've developed machines like this that can quickly count tens of thousands of fly eggs. These machines now have robotic arms for automation and much, much more. So we've got cockroaches, flies, what's next? Rodent farms. No, I'm not kidding. While the notion of growing and consuming rodents might be off-putting to many, but experts in the field, I don't know, in the field of food, will probably remind you rodent meat has long been a traditional food. While you may cringe at the thought, fried rats are a popular dish in Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, parts of the Philippines and Indonesia, Thailand, Ghana, China, Vietnam. In South and Central America, some rodent species are highly prized in cooking, and people even raise them similar to how they raise pigs and cows. Experts, apparently the same ones, even suggest that raising and eating rodents could be a solution to world hunger and malnutrition. But is it really better than eating cockroaches? I'm not so sure about that. But they have good arguments. This kind of rodent breeding can be very lucrative from an economic point of view. Rats multiply quickly. Just take a look yourself. These little guys don't need much room, making them perfect for breeding in cities. You can easily keep rodents in sheds or cages and feed them with things like grain, pellets, or leftover food. People also say that growing rats is simpler than raising cows because the rats are self-sufficient and don't require constant monitoring. Plus, they reproduce five or six times a year, with each female giving birth to two to ten babies. So you don't really need a bunch of rats on a small farm. I mean, think about it. You've got around 400 to 500 rats at once, all at different stages of growth. You can't sell them all at the same time, and honestly, you don't need to. Otherwise, who's going to keep the rat population going? Breeding the rats to a saleable weight can take two and a half to three months for females and three and a half to four months for males. It's fast. The baby rats look very small here, but that's not for long. 
Most males can grow to about 2.2 pounds in five months, but they usually get sold before reaching that size, typically weighing between 1.2 and 1.5 pounds. What about the taste? They say that rats have a richer taste than chicken. The disadvantage is that there's much less meat, so cutting takes a lot of effort and time. And well, farm-raised rats just taste different from wild ones. Wild rats can sometimes have a funky smell because you don't really know what they're eating or where they're living. Just to be clear, we looked it up. We definitely didn't eat any rats. See you later.